Okay, I'm going to do a video now uh, talking about Stephen Anderson's blasphemous beliefs about Jesus Christ actually burning in hell. Uh, you're going to need your King James Bible because we are actually going to be looking up quite a few scriptures today going through this thing. And um, I'm going to be doing a little bit more in-depth study with this video. Uh, however long it takes, it takes. It's just going to go on the secondary channels where I can upload full-length videos. But uh, I made this video and here's the comment section right for it there. But uh, the video about uh, Paul Wittenberger and his uh, blasphemous thing, that his little preaching thing, yeah, right, you know, that he did there at Stephen Anderson's Babel building. And he said that Jesus had to burn eternally in hell, or has to burn eternally in hell, to pay for sins. And I thought, you know, this is just blasphemy, and of course it is. But a couple of you actually said in the comments, that uh, Stephen Anderson actually teaches the same thing. And I did not know that. And uh, here's the one uh, comment that says, Stephen Anderson does, does indeed believe and teach that Jesus Christ literally went to hell. He talks about it at the end of his interview with James White. He, he posted the link. Thank you. I actually went to that and I watched it. Couldn't believe it. Uh, another one down here. That was uh, Lama Soul, by the way. Thank you. And uh, Hensley says... I remember when I first got saved and was listening to Stephen Anderson uh, say Jesus suffered in hell. He said it in his Jonah verses uh, by verse by verse uh, study. That was when I first started having my eyes opened about him. Okay, like I said, I've been looking into Stephen Anderson for a while now. Just to give you a little bit of, and, and I never saw this, just to give you a little bit of a history as to how um, this thing started with me and Stephen Anderson. Uh, this kind of a feud between the two of us here. And, and uh, I was on YouTube way back in 2008, and I saw some of Anderson's videos, and I thought, oh, okay, you know, he's a Bible believer and things. And, and then I started to see the post-trib thing, and I started to see a couple other things, and he was a little bit too radical and just to the point of putting on a show. He's a carnival preacher. If you haven't heard my sermon on that, you can watch that. But uh, carnival preaching, you modulate your voice and you, you make things excitement. You drum up, you know, the flesh, basically. And a lot, of, a lot of the brethren think that that's the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. Uh, Adolf Hitler used it. Uh, he would, in his speeches, he speaks very loud and very fiery. And professional wrestlers use it. Um, again, listen to the carnival preacher's study. But... I wanted to do a, a sermon on the thing of um, showing that the post-trib thing is a lie and, and let post-tribbers talk, and then I would refute them from Scripture, from the pre-trib position, pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, if you wanted to use the Bible term. But So what I did is I took part of Stephen Anderson's uh, sermons and I put them on uh, in this uh, post-trib thieves, post-trib rapture thieves study. And that was my first real, uh, you know, expose of, of Stephen Anderson. And at the time, I thought that he was saved. I was just like, well, he's probably saved. He just, you know, does not understand Bible prophecy correctly. There's, you know, some people that are like that. that, that uh, and, you know, I will say that when you get really, really, really far into the whole post-trib thing, you're really kind of messing around. That's It's very dangerous. Uh, to get into that, uh, you can watch my study on um, the false god of post-trib rapture Christians, I think it's called. But, uh, you know, it's it's dangerous to get into really, really far into the thing of being not believing in being called out before the time of Jacob's trouble. First of all, because the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, that's the title for it, the King James Bible, just to review here, the King James Bible never once calls it the Great Tribulation or the Tribulation. Those are descriptions, never used as titles in the King James Bible. And that's very important because this teaching of this Great Tribulation time period or the Tribulation time period, uh, it's a false name for it. And see, then they'll take verses to talk about that we'll have trials and tribulations or tribulations in this life. And they say, see, Christians are appointed to Tribulation, so therefore we go through the Great Tribulation. No, 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 no. <laughs> doesn't work that way. Okay, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel's 70th week is another name for it. And so there's a great confusion there. And 
when you start to get into that, you know, you'll start to head towards replacement theology. Next thing you know, they start saying, you know, these people start to say that the church has replaced Israel. There you go, replacement theology. And then they'll go so far as to say that you have to endure to the end to be saved. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 says that. Uh, they'll get into the book of Hebrews and start, you know, taking the verses to talk about, you know, uh, having to keep your faith and things. And, and if you fall away, it's impossible again to renew you to repentance and all this stuff like that. Um, continuing steadfast in the faith, all of those things. And so they'll, when they blur that distinction between the body of Christ leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble or the body of Christ going through it, and they say, well, I believe that the body of Christ goes through it, you're going to get all kinds of doctrinal problems because what they're essentially doing is they're going to the next dispensation and trying to take a bunch of things from there and apply it to today and apply stuff from today to then. You know, you have eternal security in the time of Jacob's trouble and, you know, you can take the mark. If Those that take the mark prove that they weren't really truly saved in the first place and all this. you got to mess the Bible up big time. So that's why I've always been against that, that system. So I just kind of thought that that's what Stephen Anderson was. I thought maybe he's just, you know, I called him a novice for a while. And, uh, you know, I get, I get a little bit sarcastic. I get, I get, you know, ticked off about things and, and stuff because I know that there's very serious implications behind uh, the timing of the catching away of the body of Christ. And so I'll get sarcastic. Uh, you read the Bible, there's sarcasm in there. God is often sarcastic. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was sarcastic, calling people vipers and, and uh, you know, hypocrites and, and things like that. Um, called Herod a fox at one point. I mean, it's, you know, the Apostle Paul calls them, you know, evil beasts and slow bellies. And, I mean, he, he calls people names. And, uh, you know, I don't, I think a lot of people mistake that for me hating that person. And I don't hate the person. Uh, what I'm saying is I'm being, I'm, I want to be blunt with my preaching. I don't want people to, to come away going, well, I think he's kind of okay with certain things, and I don't think the, really, the Bible really says one way or another. Uh, I'm going to be blunt. I want you to come away not having any questions, any doubts about what I teach and preach. Okay, I want you to understand what I'm saying. Okay, I believe in being very um, uh, rude in speech, but not in, in, in knowledge, you know, basically there. Uh, sometimes I'm a bit... Um, my my language isn't overly uh, <laughs> what a lot of intellectuals would use. Okay, rude doesn't necessarily even have to mean mean spirited. It can also mean just uneducated. You know. But uh, I know I myself, and there have been other brethren that have made videos talking about Stephen Anderson and saying, you know, because as Bible believing Christians. You know, we have to look at things and we have to look at men's ministries and we have to say, is this guy in line with Scripture? Is he, is he saved? You know, or is this somebody we should be recommending? Is this somebody that we should watch out for? And we're going to see later on from Scripture that, uh, yes, in fact, as Christians, we are supposed to warn about false prophets and warn about people like that. And, you know, I've struggled over the years with this thing. Is Stephen Anderson saved? Is he lost? Is he you know, what's going on, and I know a lot of you have out there too. And again, one of my standards, if you don't know this by now from watching me, one of my standards is understanding what is the most evil system on the planet. The most evil system on the planet is Roman Catholicism. Uh, why? Because the Bible identifies it as such. Revelation chapter 17 and 18, that is clearly Roman Catholicism. Mystery Babylon. You know, she rules over the kings of the earth. You know, she's, her collars are purple and scarlet. She shed the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus. I mean, the kings, you know, commit fornication, spiritual fornication with her. I mean, it's Roman Catholicism. There's no question about that. Again, I've done studies on that. So when I see the Vatican, uh, and I know their beliefs, and I've studied Catholicism now for many years, I have probably more Catholic books and materials in my home than most Catholics do. Um, and I've shown those in other studies. I, I expose it by showing the proof of those things. I mean, I've shown a lot of, you know, proofs and things against the Vatican. So I know what the Catholics teach. I know what they believe. And when I see somebody who claims to be a Bible believer 
saying things that Roman Catholics try to push and promote. You know, the red flags start to come out, you know, and I start going, uh-oh, wait a second here. This guy's supposed to be, you know, an independent fundamental Baptist, and yet he's teaching Roman Catholic things like replacement theology and, and some of the other stuff that Anderson does. And so I'll get kind of brutal with some of those types of people. Again, I want to speak frankly. I want to be blunt in what I'm saying. I don't want people, I don't want to beat around the bush. I'm not politically correct. And, you know, again, but, but I'm always kind of, you know, I'm careful and I think, you know, I'll weigh things out and see a lot of people, you know, I don't, I don't talk about this a lot of times on camera because, you know, I just want to come out with truth and boom, there it is. And, uh, you know, I, I want people, you know, that, that follow this ministry, that learn from myself. Uh, I, I want you to be, uh, you know, this thing of open-mindedness is, is somewhat dangerous because, Open-minded oftentimes means you have to compromise, and I don't want you to be a compromising, you know, kind of a Laodicean, neither hot nor cold. No, I don't want that. But weigh things always with Scripture. Always go back to the Bible and look at, you know, what does the Bible say? And like I said, I'm kind of getting, you know, off on a rabbit trail here, but the point I'm trying to make is many people have debated back and forth is Anderson, is Stephen Anderson saved? Is he really, truly a Christian? And again, there's probably going to be people that are going to say, that's nobody has a right to do that. Well, let's look about that real quickly here. We're not going to do a big study. I, I'm going to do one in the future on the thing of judging somebody's salvation as Christians. Uh, we are commanded to do such. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter two, um, verse fourteen. I'll start there. It says, "But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him; neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned." In other words, somebody who's lost, they're dead in trespasses and sins; they can't properly judge things. But look at this, verse fifteen. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things; yet he himself is judged of no man. Right? When you are spiritual, when you are saved, when you have God's Holy Spirit of truth within you, you can judge all things. Right? And you're supposed to judge all things. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Go over there. Um, well, I guess we'll just start here at verse 1. Uh, it says here, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together with, in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a lev little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sanctified for us. Okay, now... If you know the story, and again, I've talked about this in other studies, but you might not have heard this. This guy is basically committing fornication, sexual uh, relationship with his father's wife. Now, that could be his birth mother or it could just be a stepmother. The text really doesn't say. It's just his father's wife. Either way, it's a very, very bad thing. Very bad. And the Corinthians are putting up with it. They're just, they're not, they don't want to judge the guy, you know. And Paul is just like, I don't even need to be present there. This thing is wrong. It's wicked. Kick him out. You know? And it says there about verse 5, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. All right? Now, if you go over to the book of Hebrews, keep that in mind, the thing of being to del deliver to, the, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
Um, Hebrews chapter, I think of where it is here, 12. Now this is, you know, I do believe and teach that the book of Hebrews is primarily doctrinally pointed at the Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble, the Hebrew, you know. But there's also a lot of instruction and in righteousness for us today. And this is a very true verse, uh, two, well, actually three verses, which we're going to go over. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. It says here, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Okay, and uh, let's look at verse 8, because this is very important. I wasn't going to read this, but this, I just looked down. This is important. But it says here, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Okay, bastard is somebody who doesn't know their father. And there's a lot of people that profess to be Christians that don't know their father. That's why they'll talk about the God of the Old Testament. He's so mean, and I don't really believe in the God of the Old Testament. They don't know their father. But my point is here, this guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, this, this man that's, that's fornicating with his father's wife, Paul says, deliver that guy to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. But the principle here is, what happens if you say, hey, we've delivered you to Satan, you kick him out of your assembly, you say, get out, and you watch that guy, and nothing bad happens to him. Was he saved? See, that's part of the test of saying if whether somebody who's a professing Christian, are they truly saved? When they start to mess around with the flesh, when they start to mess around with sin and things and false doctrine and things like that, you step back and you say, okay, Lord, I've tried to correct them, you know, and I have, and a lot of you have out there, some of, you, some of the brethren out there, you've publicly rebuked Stephen Anderson, you've made videos exposing him and whatever else, and you look and you say, you know, okay, if he was really saved and he's just prideful and in error and not willing to admit to being in error, where's the chastisement? And I remember uh, uh, one brother out there, Rick Jacoby, actually, um, he did a video the one time about a flood hitting down there in Phoenix, Arizona, and I saw in the comments that Anderson was mocking and laughing about it. Oh, it didn't even affect my house. <laughs> you know? I mean, Anderson's coming out with all these attacks on the, on the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and Rick's like, you know, hey, there's a flood that just hit down there, and Anderson laughed about it. In other words, when chastening comes to an area, when, when it's like God's judgment is coming, Stephen Anderson laughs about it. And it's, it's interesting because of all the different videos I've ever seen with Anderson, you know, when he talks about sin, it's just almost like a, well, you know, yes, well, all of sin. It's just kind of a general thing. It's not like he, it's, it's real, like I've never really seen anywhere where he's really grieved by his own sin, where he really feels that guilt of, of you know, Christ Jesus came in, or died for sinners of whom I am chief, you know, where you talk about, you know, Paul in Romans chapter 7 says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know, when you get saved and you're genuinely saved, you're going to be grieved by your sin. There's going to be times that you're going to, you're going to do stuff and you're going to think, I can't believe I just did that. You know, and you're just going to feel dirty and just like, oh, man. You say, well, your sins are paid for. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be grieved by them. You know, but I, I haven't really seen that much with Stephen Anderson, you know, or Jack Hiles, you know, Stephen Anderson's mentor, you know, and, uh, some of these guys, it's that Hiles cult, you know, that, that teaches that there's no repentance. It's just easy believism stuff. Again, I've covered that in other studies. But my point is, with Stephen Anderson, if he is genuinely saved, where's the chastisement? I mean, he, is, he has preached downright heresy, very serious heresy. Where's the chastisement? I don't see any. So what is he? Well, I believe according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8, I believe he's a bastard. And I don't say that as just a crude, you know, kind of, a, you know, attack. 
I'm saying I believe he's not. I don't. I don't believe he's actually one of my brothers in Christ. I don't believe he is. And I don't believe that uh, Paul Wittenberger is one of my sisters in Christ. He tries to act like a sister, but you know, you know, <laughs> guy's very effeminate. If you haven't seen any of his little uh, videos, but another story. But uh, if you haven't been convinced, you say, well, yes, but I still think he's saved, blah, blah, blah. We're going to watch some video clips now of Stephen Anderson, and I'm going to debunk it from Scripture. Um, again, this is going to be uh, part of the reason of me doing this study is I want to actually um, show this teaching. And I mean, I don't know anybody who's serious, a serious student of Scripture, that believes this way. I mean, I've never even heard of this thing before, that Jesus burned in hell. But we're actually going to look at these videos now, and I'm going to show you what Stephen Anderson teaches and from the King James Bible why he is wrong. So let's watch the first clip. And this is, uh, let me say this before I get started. This is an older video. Uh, this is like way back, like 2009 or something, I think, or 2008, maybe 2010, somewhere in there. It's the old, old, old videos. And when you watch and he's talking, he's doing the, the satanic salute thing. You know, he'll do that. So watch for this. He said, I'm the first and the last. I'm beginning. He said, I'm he that was dead. He said, I'm he that was dead and am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus, don't try to tell me that Jesus was not dead. Don't tell me that only his body was dead. Jesus truly died in every sense of the word. Because not only did his spirit, not only did his body die, but his soul went to hell. Okay, that's death. That's being, people that are in hell right now are referred to in the Bible as being dead. People who are in heaven are referred to as being alive. And so he was dead. He was in hell for three days and three nights. What happened three days later? He rose again from the dead. He came back to life. Okay, so Jesus was truly dead. I mean, body, soul, and spirit. Then the God had died. Okay, um, again, if you don't understand this, you know, people say, how can you be three in one? Well, very simple. Uh, man is created in God's image and after God's likeness. So every man out there is uh, a uh, tripartite being. In other words, we have three parts to us. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. If you want to see that thing illustrated, you have a, if you have a ball, a football, we'll say, the outside of the football is the flesh. It's made of leather, right? Leather's not going to hold in the air. So what do you have? You have a rubber lining inside that leather skin. That would be your soul, very similar to the soul. What do you have inside? You have air, spirit, spirit referring to like the, the wind. You know, you can study that whole thing. So, man is a body, soul, and spirit, right? That's what the Bible teaches. And I, I have a study on that, too. I can't remember which, which one that is, but, you know, just you can search through my uh, sermons here on YouTube. I've, you know, there again, I've, I have 700 and, 780 videos or something like that right now. So, I mean, I've done a lot of, many, many years of preaching all these subjects in, in great detail. So, it's out there. I mean, it's, it's, it's there on my channel, you can listen to it. I can't go over every single thing in this study. But the fact of the matter is, we have body, soul, and spirit, so does the Lord. And when Jesus Christ was on the cross, when he's dying, it says, he says at one point, he says, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The soul leaves. And he dies and he gave up the ghost. The spirit leaves. So what part of the God had died? Only the body. That's why in the time of Jacob's trouble, in the book of Revelation, you see a third of this is killed, a third of that is killed. Why? Because a third of the body, or a third of the Godhead was killed on the cross. Only Jesus Christ. I mean, think about something. If the Godhead bodily, the Trinity, if you want to call it that, you know, I know that's not a Bible word, but the Godhead is the Bible word there. If the Godhead was in hell, um, and he says, you know, at one point I'll say about three days and three nights, the, you know, Jesus was there for, in hell for three days and three nights. Okay, let's just say it wasn't eternally. Let's just say it was only three days and three nights that the Godhead was in hell burning. 
uh, question. Who was running heaven while God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son were in hell burning? Who was running heaven? It's kind of a problem, isn't it? But let's continue here. This is a more recent uh, sermon. <laughs> I hate to call it that, but this is a more uh, recent little immature rant here. And um, we're going to see him getting into this thing of Jesus actually burning in hell. Let's watch this. Now, here's the thing. If, if you walk out here tonight and say, you know what? I don't think Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights. I think that it was, he was just in a good side, a good place in the center of the earth, paradiso in the center of the earth. You're entitled to your opinion, but don't say that the King James Bible is your final authority because it's not. <laughs> okay. And uh, what this little liar does, he will never take you to the actual passage. But we're going to go there. Go to Luke chapter 16. He'll take you to some of the prophecies that talk about Jesus going to this place called hell. And see, uh, just to tell you, if, again, if you're new to this and you don't understand this doctrine, in the Old Testament, um, people were, they were sacrificing animals. Okay, now we're going to see this as we continue in the study. Uh, those, that blood that those animals had, it was not perfect. It was not sinless. Therefore, they could not go to heaven when they died. Their sins were covered, but they were not taken away until the cross. And so when somebody died in the Old Testament, they could not go up to heaven the way we do today. I mean, the Bible t teaches with a Christian that you know, when you die, you're absent from the body present with the Lord. That was not true in the Old Testament. Again, Stephen Anderson very pridefully boasts about being non-dispensational. Mike Hoggard does the same thing. Uh, these guys are, you know, I had somebody ask in the, in the comments, they said, you say that people that, that are non-dispensational, uh, that that's satanic. So you're saying that somebody that's a non-dispensationalist is satanic. Well, that depends on how much they know. Okay, I, I mean, if somebody just is newly saved and they don't understand the thing of dispensational teaching, uh, well, no, they're not, they're not satanic. But if you have somebody that studies dispensationalism and they understand what dispensationalism is and they reject it, then yeah, that's satanic. That person is a lost person. I don't believe that you can be saved and vehemently deny that there are different things going on within the Bible. I mean, obviously in the Old Testament, things are different than they are in the New Testament. I mean, if, if, if nothing else, you have to believe in at least two dispensations, Old Testament, New Testament. Obviously, things have changed. You know, and if you reject that, you're going to end up like Stephen Anderson, you know, just making the whole Bible into a mess. I mean, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a command. It's not an option. It's not given as, well, if you feel like it or whatever. No, it's a command of Scripture. So when somebody disobeys an extremely important command, they make a mess of the gospel, they start preaching false gospels like Stephen Anderson is doing here, and it's just a real mess. But Luke chapter 16, verse 19, we'll read down through here. It says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Okay, just a real quick little jab there. If you are a having, having a hard time financially, you're not a very rich person. I know a lot of you are. Um, don't worry about the rich people. Okay, their time is coming. Don't worry about that. But uh, getting back to the actual Bible doctrine, uh, I mean, if you're saved, you're rich. Let me say it that way. You'll be rich for eternity. 
But getting back to the actual Bible doctrine, the thing that's going on here, Stephen Anderson is going to say, coming up here, one of these video clips uh, that we're going to be watching, he is actually going to say that Abraham's bosom is, you know, where, where Lazarus was, is up in heaven. And that the rich man in hell lifts up his eyes and looks up into heaven. I mean, he must have had some really good eyesight to be able to see the whole way up to heaven, you know. And why is it that a guy down in the heart of the earth can look up and see heaven, but we can't look up and see heaven? A few little problems there. But uh, not only that, it says here, uh, verse 26, uh, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. Um... If somebody's in the heart of the earth and somebody's up in heaven, there's no gulf between them. Okay? Uh, gulf is like a, you know, you have the Gulf of Mexico or something. What is that? That's a, it's a big hole that's filled with water. <laughs> you know, and in hell, there's apparently some kind of a, a huge, you know, gulf that was fixed between the inhabitants of Abraham's bosom over there and the people that were in hell. So, they are resting over there, waiting for Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to now pay for their sins so that they can go to heaven. We're going to see that here in a minute. But the people that are in hell can see them over there. Okay, this is Bible doctrine. Okay, this is, this is sound scriptural exposition. All right, you, There's no way that people in the Old Testament went to heaven. Uh, that's just not there. The only exceptions to that would be people like, you know, men like Enoch and Elijah. They were called up to heaven. But the other people died. And that's why you see in the Old Testament, they go down, they sleep with their fathers, the Bible. He died and he slept with his fathers. He went down. All right. Um, uh, Samuel, when you have King Saul, he calls him up from the dead. And, it came, and you know Samuel comes up and he's like, "Why did you wake me? Why you know why'd you wake me up?" Basically, okay, he didn't come down from heaven; he came up. So Anderson is is again, you know, because it's like sometimes you look at this guy and you go, "Is he really this ignorant of Scripture, or is this willful ignorance? Is this deception?" And I believe it's deception. At first, I was kind of thinking, "Oh, he's just a novice. You know, he really doesn't know or whatever." But the guy will not be admonished. He will never admit to being wrong. Um, he's extremely prideful. And a lot of what he is teaching is very, very serious heresy. So it's not ignorance on his part. It is actual deception. I believe that very firmly. But uh, Abraham's bosom is, is in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 down through 31. You can read about that. And it's very clear that there are two different chambers down there. All right. But uh, we're going to go to, over in your Bible, there's a lot of scriptures that we can look up here. Um, but, of course, you know, I can't go over every single thing again. I've talked about it in other studies. But we're going to go to another one here to prove what I'm saying. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Okay, it says here, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now look at verse 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Huh? Kind of an odd thing. Verse 20. Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. goes back into the Old Testament times there. Okay. Who were these spirits in prison? You know, they were the people that were down in the heart of the earth. That's what's going on there. And again, let me just show you over in the book of Hebrews. See where I'm going to go to here. Again, I don't, I don't have a lot of notes written for this or anything because a lot of this is just very basic, simple understanding of Scripture. The Old Testament saints could not go to heaven when they died. Uh, you know, if you talk to an a Orthodox Jew or somebody, you know, that's Jewish that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, they do not believe that they go to heaven when they die. They believe they go down there and they await the resurrection. Okay, so even Jews that are still, 
doctrinally believing in the Old Testament and rejecting the New Testament, they still believe that they go down into the earth, not that they go up to heaven when they die. So again, you see Anderson perverting Scripture. He's taking New Testament things for a Christian and applying them to the Old Testament. It's ridiculous. Hebrews chapter 10. We'll start at verse 1. It says here, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have... For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once, once purged should have had no more conscience of sins, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Look at verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. All the Old Testament sacrifices, the animal sacrifices and everything else, it was there to cover for the sins. All right? But it never took them away. That's why they could not go to heaven when they died. And we're going to see here in a little bit that Anderson actually says that Abraham uh, was in heaven looking down and seeing Jesus walking around on the earth. I mean, it's just insanity. But, you know, again there, you see this thing. And if you don't know about the dispensational thing, turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to start here at verse... Uh, I guess we'll go up to verse 8 and start reading down through here. It says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service, service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Okay, so you see the Old Testament law there, okay, which we just read about in, in chapter 10. It's, it's clarified in chapter 10 that the animal sacrifices can't make the comers there unto perfect. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. What was the time of refor reformation? Keep reading. Verse 11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling, sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, if you are not familiar with my sermons, again, let me explain. The New Testament does not begin in Matthew chapter 1. The New Testament, according to our text here in Hebrews chapter 9, the New Testament begins in, or excuse me, after the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's when the New Testament officially begins. That's why you see many times in the Gospels, you'll see, go show yourself to the priest. Mary gives birth to Jesus and she goes and she has to do the, the sacrifice, you know, the appropriate sacrifice there. and Go to the priest and they're going to the synagogue and everything else. Because doctrinally you are in the Old Testament. When Jesus dies on the cross, when his blood is shed, now the New Testament begins. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay, now look down at verse 22 here in chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. It says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. All right, now we're going to see later on here that Stephen Anderson says that, that you know, Jesus dying on the cross was just part of it. You know, that wasn't what took away your sins. You know, it was that he had to burn down there in hell. You know, take your place in hell and burn down there for a while. Okay. Uh, no, he didn't. You know, but we're going to see this thing here. And, you know, it's just so important to understand. I mean, you go through the entire New Testament here in terms of 
when Jesus died on the cross and, and you go through, and it's the cross. It's the blood that was shed. It's never that you're purified because of Jesus burning for a while down there. You know, the Godhead burning for a while, according to Anderson here. So just kind of a, a little, give you some, some understanding of Scripture here. This is basic Bible doctrine, but Anderson is such a master with twisting words and, and changing th meanings and stuff that he can actually take somebody away from just an understanding of Scripture, that basic understanding of the Bible. And um, I've seen this thing with these false prophets there. Again, I'll get, I'll get very worked up with these people because I've been dealing with false prophets for many years now. But they'll do this thing where they'll just like, they say so many things and they just leave you so confused and you're going, what in the world? I mean, I'll listen to Anderson. Some of my video studies I've done in the past and I, I watch him and I'll watch a couple hours of the guy, you know, watching video after video after video. And I get so mentally exhausted and just tired and just, just like, I don't even know half the stuff I watched, you know. <laughs> I mean, if I'm not pausing and taking videos and things, or taking notes, excuse me, taking notes, I'll forget half of what he said. There's a spirit of confusion that comes through him. So having said that, let's get back to watching some of these videos and I'll further debunk what he's saying. What's the significance of the Passover being roasted with fire is that Jesus Christ went to hell for three days and three nights. Now, the reason why it's important doctrinally that he went to hell for three days and three nights is because Jesus said, I'm he that liveth and was dead. And I'm alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Now, Abraham, you say, well, he went to Abraham's bosom. But here's the thing. Abraham, if you remember, was the one that Jesus used as an example when he said, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So when Jesus walked the earth, he said, Abraham's still alive. Now, why is that? Because Abraham is in heaven. And people in heaven are not dead. Okay, you see what I'm talking about here, you know, in terms of this thing of confusion and everything else? I mean, it's just incredible. Just a couple, maybe a minute or so there, maybe not even a minute, and it's just like you come out going, huh? You know? Okay, first of all, the Passover was burned because it was an animal. Okay, there was a dead body there. You kill the lamb, you take the blood, you put it up on top of the door, you put it on the two sides. What are you going to do with the body? Okay, uh, Jesus shed his blood, but he's eternal. He was God manifest in the flesh, was and is God manifest in the flesh. There's no body there that you have to dispose of. Okay, so comparing Jesus Christ to the animal there, yeah, the Bible says that he's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's true. But it's not... You know, you're not dealing with a body of, you know, corruptible animal flesh that needs to be burned and disposed of. Again, you know, why can't he understand this thing here? But you see this thing of him saying that Abraham uh, was, you know, he, he says that Abraham is not the, the, you know, or I'm not the God of the, the dead but of the living and, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so that they're living. Um, well, they were, they're sleeping, you know, but they're not living in heaven. And I'm going to show you the text that he uses and uh, show you why it doesn't work. You can go to John chapter 8. He'll actually bring this up later on in one of the video clips here. Um, John chapter 8, verse 56, where we'll start reading here. Jesus speaking, he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Now, Anderson, well, what he'll do is he'll say uh, that, see, Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus' day, meaning that Abraham was up in heaven looking down and seeing Jesus right at that very minute there. So he was rejoicing in heaven. Okay, uh, well... Again, what do you do about the thing of the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin? What do you do about the fact of Abraham's bosom? I, he rejects Abraham's bosom. I realize that Abraham's bosom is up there, not down there. You know, when you have the guy in hell looking up through the earth, past where we can see, up into heaven and seeing Lazarus up there. You know, yeah. But 
what he does is he says, Abraham's up there, he's looking down. Okay, but what's actually going on in the passage here? And this is a very interesting study. Abraham saw Jesus Christ before Jesus Christ was born of Mary. You say, huh, what, what? Yeah. Let's finish reading here, and then, I'll, then we'll go to the other text. I'm gonna, I want to go to the other text, but let me just finish reading here. Uh, <clears throat> verse 57, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Look at Jesus' answer. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. That's God's title. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. They got angry at him because he just gave, he just basically said, I am. That's a title of God. That's reserved for God. So if anybody says, well, Jesus never really claimed to be God the Father. Oh, he did right there. And that's why they got that mad at him. Uh, so, but why would Jesus Christ say that Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad? Verse 56. Well... Let's turn over to the book of Hebrews. This is some of what's going to be preached to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, I believe, by uh, <clears throat> Moses and Elijah. They're going to be preaching out of the book of Hebrews, I believe. Uh, there's a lot in the book of Hebrews. It talks about our fathers in the wilderness and our fathers this and that. You know, it's it's you can clearly see that it's written to a Jewish audience. You know, uh, my father was not. You know, my ancestors were not, you know, with the nation of Israel wandering through the desert and things like this. You know, but if you're Jewish, they were. But let's start here. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, with having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So when in the Bible, or when Jesus Christ said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad, what's he talking about? Abraham saw Jesus in a pre-incarnate form. Joshua saw him as well. Joshua, he looks and he sees this man and he says, Are you for us or them, basically? And, and he says, I'm captain of the Lord's host. Bow down, you know, and he falls down, bows down before him. Many times in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ shows up in a pre-incarnate form. He's the angel of the Lord. You know, and you, when you see angels in the Old Testament... People bow down to him. It's like, hey, get up. You know, whenever you see angels in the Bible, they don't let people bow down to him. But when the angel of the Lord shows down shows up, Paul wrote about it in the book of Acts. He says about you know the angel of the Lord appeared unto me this this day or this night in a dream. I think how it went, and uh, who I am, or whose I am, and whom I serve. Okay, it's not just talking about a regular angel. So uh, many times the, the term angel of the Lord is a reference to Jesus Christ making a special appearance. Okay, And you say, well, that doesn't really make much sense to me. That's why the Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. All right? God is not going to be just this easy to explain, oh yeah, he's just like you know this easy thing here. No. The mystery of godliness is great. Uh, we serve in an infinitely powerful God that is so far above our level of understanding, you know, a lot of it you're just not going to make sense of. It's just the just shall live by faith, okay? We have to live by faith in what the Bible says. You say, prove all this stuff to me, you know, scientifically. I can't. I can't. I live by faith. There's a lot about the Bible that I can prove scientifically. Um, there's a lot about Scripture and creation and things like that. I mean, I'm not ever going to be dumb enough to believe in evolution. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. Uh, it's just absurd nonsense. Everything came from nothing accidentally. Yeah, okay, stupid. Uh, I can prove that there is a creator. Okay, I can prove that by the creation that's out there. Definitely. But certain aspects of the Godhead? Nope. 
the just shall live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. That's just the way that, that, it, that it is. But what you're seeing here in Hebrews chapter 7 is what Jesus Christ is referring to in John chapter 8. Right? When, he, when he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad, right there, when Jesus Christ showed up as this you know, Mel Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. Uh, and it says there, made like unto the Son of God, verse 3. Right there. So that's what he's referring to. Jesus Christ is not saying that Abraham is up in heaven looking down. Again, Anderson is, is either ignorant or he is deliberately lying to deceive people. I believe the second one. But let's continue here. We're going to look at a couple more clips. Why, why even have all these burnt offerings representing Jesus? Okay, he says, why even have all these burnt offerings representing Jesus? See, again, again, he's a master at doing this. He will, he will set up straw man arguments, and then you know, he'll set up this little dummy argument. If you don't know what a straw man ar argument is, I know some of you are younger out there. You might not have heard of that. It's basically you erect a false argument, and then you base truth from then on off of the false argument. You say, see, here's a proof that Jesus was a burnt offering, and so now that we know that he was a burnt offering, why this and why that? And you go, wait a second, you didn't prove that he was a burnt offering in the beginning. That's a straw man argument. Okay, it's like creating a, a man out of straw, a fake man. And then you say, oh, he's the proof of such and such. No, he isn't. So again, you know, why were all their, these burnt offerings, you know, representing Jesus Christ? They didn't represent Jesus Christ. They represented animals that had to be, that had to be slain to cover the people's sins. But the sins weren't taken away until that perfect Lamb of God came and took away the sin. Let's continue. That's kind of a weak parallel. You know, the Bible says it was a burnt offering, it was roast with fire because of hell. The Bible says it was a burnt offering, burnt sacrifice because of hell. Um, the Bible said that? Uh, I'd like to see a chapter and verse on that, please. Stephen Anderson, please provide a chapter and verse on that. Or any of your little followers out there, any of these people that sub or, uh, ascribe to this type of philosophy that Jesus burned in hell, please show me where it says that there was uh, burnt offerings, you know, how did he say that? See, I can't even remember what he said. It was a burnt offering as roast of fire because of hell. Okay. It was a burnt offering because of hell. Show me in the Bible where it says that. Give you a little hint. It's not in there. But let's continue. And by the way, it makes perfect sense when you think about the fact that the punishment for our sins, if we die in our sins, is to go where? And so Jesus went there and paid for our sins. Okay, if you die in your sins, yes, you will go to hell. Uh, our God is a consuming fire. And so if you get into his presence uh, and you aren't saved, you're not redeemed, uh, you haven't been born again, you're going to burn. Okay, but to say that Jesus paid for our sins by burning in hell, uh, that is completely without scriptural support. All right. You say, prove that. I was hoping you'd say that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The very definition of the gospel that we preach today is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So let's look for burning, okay? Follow along in your Bible and we will see where it says that Jesus burned as payment for our sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Okay, this is very clear. Paul is saying, this is the gospel. I preached it to you, you received it, you know, and you're saved unless you believed in vain, unless you were just lying to me, basically, you know. Verse 3, here's the gospel. 
For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this pre present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me, also as of one born out of due time. I didn't see anything about burning in there. I didn't see anything about Jesus being a burnt sacrifice, a burnt offering to pay for our sins, that he had to pay for our sins by burning in hell. You see, this is blasphemy, what Stephen Anderson is proposing here. All right, absolute total blasphemy. I'm going to show you another very important verse to prove this. Acts chapter 20. Another definition, uh, key defining verse uh, for our gospel that we have today. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own burnt offering in hell. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. Read along in your King James Bible if you don't have one. You better get one. Uh, you can get them cheaper and things. You can even look them up online and things. I, I recommend having a written one. But um, it says here, To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Key scripture. Talking about God. And it says, which he per hath purchased with his own blood. It wasn't just regular blood, you know, the blood of a man that was shed on the cross. It was God's blood. Jesus Christ was God and is God. But now look at verse 29. Again, some of you are saying, why are you doing this study, Brian? Here's why. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That's what I do. I try to get you to the book. This is your final authority, the King James Bible. That's the way the thing works. But my job as a preacher is not just all positive, just all good, feel-good exhortation, whatever else. I have to look out for false prophets. I have to judge men like this that enter in among us and they don't spare they go after the young Christians that are newly saved and try to get them messed up in doctrine, try to get them off base. That's why I'm going after this guy. And let me tell you something. You don't need me to disprove or to, to show you that this guy is wrong and crooked. A lot of you have said about that. Yeah, I knew Stephen Anderson was, was bad before I even found you. You know, before, before you even found me, I'm saying. You know, yeah, the Holy Spirit will lead you and teach you and show you that guy is not legitimate. But again, this study here, you say, why are you doing this study? Why shouldn't you be out, you know, doing other things and stuff and talking about other subjects? Yeah, I would really like to. But you see, I also have to look and say, where are we at prophetically on God's prophetic time frame here? Well, we are just about at the end of the church age here, and we are going to be leaving soon as the body of Christ, and then it's going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. So what is the legacy that I'm going to leave? I need to have things set up for the time of Jacob's trouble saints that are coming. That's why I'm focusing so much on this thing of, you know, debunking these people that call themselves Christians and yet they hate Israel. All right. Um, it's very important to get this stuff out. But let's continue here. I'll show you a couple more video clips.